As uh, tends to be the case, I often uh, feel the need to confess things, and so I'm going to confess a thing because I think this is a safe place. But uh, I uh, am a pretty decent guy now, but I used to be a knucklehead, and that is just a fact. Um, you, can, you can look at uh, what my teachers used to say about me, uh, probably still in my uh, uh, personal record uh, at, at the school if those things are still around. I don't know. Uh, I just Sometimes I wouldn't always behave in a way that was kind or uh, reciprocal, and so we're in the series on spiritual gifts, and uh, I, I was remembering a, uh, a story where I, uh, I was given uh, a magazine uh, right before Christmas time, and I was supposed to circle all the things that I want as a child. So I'm like probably 11 or 12. Do you guys remember doing this? Is this still a thing? Uh, this was back when you would get like huge books of a magazine. So my grandma, she would get like the J.C. Penney's magazine, which is like a phone book of just pictures. I mean, that book had to have been like a $60 book even back then. Um, and then you have like the Sears book and you have like the Walmart thing. And so the, 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 the week was, um, and I'm sure this was just a, like a child care tip for, I'm, I'm sure she had already decided what she was going to get me, but it was entertainment for an 11 year old. Like here, take these books. Here's a pen, circle all the things you want. And I would spend hours doing it. So I'd just kind of go through all this circle what I want. Like in November, uh, Christmas comes around and I get my gifts. And I took the gift, and uh, how, how foolish would it be? This is, this is not really what happened. But how foolish would it be if I took, like, this nicely wrapped gift, and I was like, oh, thanks, Nana, and I just, like, walked away with it. I never opened it. I just, like, I took it home. I put it on the shelf. I looked at it. I was like, oh, I got a gift. How sweet is that? Like, that'd be silly because it, it wouldn't have any of the things that, that I wanted in it. Uh, and, and so what, what did happen, in fact, was that I, I opened the gift, and one of the things I had circled was in this package. But the problem was, I was 11 years old, I was a knucklehead, and like what I wanted and what I desired changed so rapidly, back and forth, that the thing that I wanted in November, I thought was now the dumbest thing ever. And so it was a watch with a calculator on it, Okay. Now, some of you, you're laughing. You're like, well, didn't you have that on your phone? No, man. We had like wireless phones with like the antenna you had to pull out, you know? Like uh, the, the idea of having a calculator on your watch to me was so interesting because I could solve any problem with just the, with, now I have the whole internet in my pocket, but this is before the internet. You could just, you could just like, I could, I could have all the answers on the math test. And so I knew I wanted it in November, but something happened at school. Like I had the wrong color shoes on one day. And so now I'm like, oh, that, only nerds have the calculator watch. And so Nana gives me the very thing that I asked for to do the very thing that I wanted to do. And I was just, I wasn't having it. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, thank, thank you. And I just kind of put it away. And she knew I didn't like it at the time, but I, I did my best. And I just put it away. I never even took it out of the package. I just left it in its package. Uh, later that day, I put it in my drawer in, in, in my house, in my bedroom. And like the next day, I didn't put it on. The day after that, the week later, I'm going over to Nana and Papa's house and I didn't have the watch on. My dad was like, hey, you, you, they want to see you wear the thing that they got you. You know, you should, you should wear that. It's like, oh, it's dumb. I don't, I don't want it. And his response was, but it's exactly what you asked for. Like, that's exactly what you wanted. And, and I tried to defend myself because, as previously stated, I was a knucklehead. Now, looking back on it, like, how arrogant is that? E even if I hadn't asked for the thing, uh, if someone gives you a gift, you're like, thank you so much. You thought about me. You, you actually got something specific to me. I actually would have used it, uh, like, on a math test or something. Um, you know, but, but I, was, I was a jerk. I didn't receive it well. Um, we, have to, we have to open our gifts at Christmas for them to actually be useful, and then we should receive them with thankfulness, right? We should use them uh, in, in pursuit of, you know, what we're going to use them for. And that's similar to what we're going to talk about today. We're, we're continuing our series on spiritual gifts, and like what we did last week was just sort of this introduction, this flyover of, okay, what is not a spiritual gift? And then we, we dug into 1 Corinthians 12 as like this... Um, uh, uh, intensive look at what a definition of a spiritual gift might be. And so we worked all the way through chapter 12. Uh, and, then, and then we landed the plane last week, but I never actually articulated a definition, a working definition of spiritual gifts. So I want to start today uh, by talking about what a working definition of spiritual gifts are. Uh, and then we will move into Romans chapter 12. So if you wanted to go ahead and turn there, you, you can. Romans 12. A working definition of spiritual gifts. This is not a definition that I found in a book. Uh, this is one that I worked out based on what I was studying. Um, and I'll be honest with you, 
uh, I reserve the right to change my mind in a few years. Like, if I want to change something about this, like, this is an area that I'm, I'm growing in, I'm learning in, and so uh, it's, it's just uh, one of those things. But this, I think, is a good working definition of a spiritual gift. What is a spiritual gift? Spiritual gifts are, uh, I'm going to give it in five parts, this definition in five parts. They are unique callings and abilities placed on individual believers. We saw that last week in 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to see it in every passage we look at about spiritual gifts, that the Lord determines what gifts he gives. He determines what's in the wrapper. We don't. Um, he, he, we may ask for them, uh, and he may choose to give the ones that we ask, or he may just choose to give us something different. But they are unique gifts and abilities placed on individual believers by God at his own discretion and for his own purposes. What, what is the purpose of spiritual gifts? It's for the purposes of God. It's for what he wants to accomplish. Uh, they are to work in conjunction with gifts given to other individual members of the same church. One, one important understanding of spiritual gifts and just your role in church is that we need each other. Uh, according to scripture, uh, no individual Christian is universally equipped to tackle all the things that the church is intended to tackle. Therefore, we need to show up. We need to be a part of a body somewhere so that we can accomplish the things that we're supposed to accomplish in, in unison, in, in conjunction with the other parts of the body around us. They are for the common good and the building up of the entire gathered church. You're going to see this in every passage that we look at on spiritual gifts. What is it supposed to do? Is it so that I can look cool? Is it so that I can accomplish my things for my goals? No, it is for the common good. The spiritual gifts that the Lord has given me are for you. He gave them to me to express them and use them for your benefit. And the spiritual gifts that the Lord gave you are for you. And you, for you, like we need each other's gifts. It is for our common good. And uh, the accomplishment of the church's mission to bring glory to God through the message of the person and work of Jesus Christ. The, the end result is that the church would be fully equipped to preach Jesus in a world that needs to know this message so that they will receive the hope and life that is found in Jesus Christ. So that's our definition, unique callings and abilities placed on individual believers by God at his own discretion and for his own purposes to work in conjunction with gifts given to other individual members of the same church for the common good and the building up of the entire gathered church and the accomplishment of the church's mission to bring glory and God through the message of the person and work of Jesus Christ. You guys ready for the test? It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? It's a thorough definition. It's not one of those pithy ones. Um, you don't need to memorize it, but I think it is important that we understand that spiritual gifts aren't for us. They're not, they're not for us to play, you know, patty cake or to show off how spiritually mature we are. You never see spiritual gifts used as a measure of maturity. What you see is the fruit of the Spirit used as a measure of maturity. Spiritual gifts are things that we are gifted in order to play our role in the body that the Lord has placed us into, okay? And so uh, let's ask a couple of questions. These are common questions. Some of these questions I've received since we've kicked off this series from people uh, as, as we look in this. Are the spiritual gifts of the Bible still in operation today? Can we expect to see all of the spiritual gifts in the Bible in the church, in the modern day church today, somewhere, somehow? There are uh, two schools of thought on this that have big 10 cent words, okay? And so on the one side, you have cessationism, and that is that some or all of the spiritual gifts in the Bible have ceased. Most of the people who believe that believe that they ceased after the apostles died and after the Bible was established, that some or all of the spiritual gifts, you, you shouldn't expect them anymore. Those are called cessationists. They've ceased. The other end of the spectrum is called continuationist. That is that all of the spiritual gifts, some or all, are in continuation today. You should expect them uh, in some form or that the Lord has access to them if he wants them to, okay? And so falling on this spectrum, you can, you can go a lot of different ways, uh, but it, it's, not just, it's not just this one clear camp and this other clear camp. It's, it's a line that you can land in different spots on. Uh, I, uh, in the last... 15 years or so, I've moved across this line in what I believe about the spiritual gifts uh, over time. Um, some denominational beliefs, just overall, if you're curious about this, like those who are continuationists that believe that the spiritual gifts continue uh, into modern day, those denominations that believe that are going to be some Baptists, um, Catholics, which I was surprised to find out, uh, Methodists, Pentecostals, Assemblies of God, um, and any any 
form of Christianity that we might call charismatics. That's usually the, the frame that that is. And th those people would be the continuationists. The denominations that have a stance on cessationism, that the gifts have ceased or some of them have, are going to be some, but not all, Baptists. Presbyterians, uh, most of your Reformed Protestants, and most any church that teaches what is called dispensational theology. If you know what that is, then that makes sense. If you don't, the sermon isn't about that. It's a boring answer, but I can answer it later. Ask me. I'll tell you what dispensational theology is. Um, to show you uh, kind of where this is, like, well, which one's right? Which one's wrong? You know, uh, is this a big issue? Should we make a big deal about this? I'm going to tell you what my view is. I'll tell you what our church's view is here in a second, but I want to show you some names of people that are continuationists and names that are cessationists. And what I want you to know is that everybody on this list are Christians. They are Christians worth listening to. They are great teachers. Uh, if you agree with them, if you disagree with them, they, they, are, uh, uh, they are people that teach God's word well. What I'm, my point is this, is that wherever you land on spiritual gifts, whether you're a continuationist or a cessationist, I'm going to tell you it is a secondary issue. You should not break fellowship with people. In fact, we have people in this church, in this body of people, that some are continuationists, some believe that all the spiritual gifts uh, are available to us today, and some are cessationists, and you have a place here. You are welcome in this body because this is a secondary issue unless you attach some or all of the spiritual gifts to salvation. And some churches do that. And that's where I'm going to have a, a, a more firm conversation. Like, no, 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 it, it is not a sign of being saved or un, unsaved. So here, here are some names. Some uh, well-known cessationists, uh, John MacArthur. Uh, in fact, he has a, an entire conference about uh, the absence of gifts called... Uh, I think it's called Strange Fire, something like that. Tim Keller, an amazing Bible teacher, uh, believes that the gifts uh, CC passed away last year. Uh, Charles Stanley also passed away last year, wrote a great book on spiritual giftedness, uh, but believes that the, the sign gifts, we'll talk about that here in a moment, uh, have ceased. Rick Warren, uh, he's interesting because he's a cessationist, but he went to a Pentecostal uh, conference and was a keynote speaker and told them, you don't need to stop your spiritual gifts. You need to explain them and you need to teach them to people. I just found that interesting that as a, as a individual, he believes that those gifts, the gifts of tongues, healing, prophecy, that those have ceased. But then he spoke to the Pentecostals saying, don't stop doing it, uh, but you need to teach people about what you're doing. Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, those are also cessationists. And St. Augustine, which is, uh, he's an interesting one because most of his writings, there's no miraculous gifts at all until you get to his last writing, City of God, and he seems to change his mind. So maybe he also was moving down the spectrum. Are these respectable teachers worth listening to? Yes, yeah, these are, these are good people. Let's look at some continuationists, some uh, that have gone on the record as continuationists. Matt Chandler of the Village Church. Um, Max Licato, he is a fascinating one because he's actually written a blog that he prays in tongues every day, um, and he's a Baptist pastor. Uh, interesting fact, by the way, uh, Lifeway did a study uh, about Baptist pastors, and apparently 50% of Baptist pastors believe that some people are given the spiritual gift of praying in tongues. I, I found that fascinating because most people would say, well, Baptists don't believe that. Well, apparently 50% do, not 51, not 49. In 2007, 50% of Baptist pastors said that. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a continuationist. John Piper is a continuationist. Wayne Grudem, who has written one of the keynote systematic theologies, like a textbook that is used in every seminary, is a continuationist. Charles Spurgeon, uh, he claimed to have the gift of prophecy and on multiple occasions would, in the middle of a sermon, uh, he, he's written about this, in the middle of a sermon, he would call someone out in the crowd having no knowledge about them, and they would, they would repent of what had happened. He, he's in the middle of a sermon sermon, and he points at a guy, and he says, those gloves you're wearing, you stole. You need to repent and turn back to Jesus. And then he finishes the sermon about whatever it was. The guy comes up to him later. He says, I've never stolen before in my life. Please don't tell my boss. And he took the gloves off and handed them to Spurgeon. He was completely freaked out by it. And Spurgeon would go on to write. He says, this happened to me. It's not every day. He can't plan it. He doesn't know when it's going to happen. But Spurgeon would say at least a dozen times in his ministry, he would be walking down the hallway and just see someone and know to say something to them, and he called it a gift of prophecy, and, and John Wesley. Are these good Bible teachers? Can we agree? Yeah. So um, this, is, this is just the spectrum. I need you to see, like, there's a lot of good people on both sides, and you can agree to disagree, and you can come to your own conclusions. Um, 
Real quick, this, this is turning into a, a far drier sermon than I intended, okay? So this is like, I, I promise, we're going to open the Bible in a second. We're going to have fun. There's going to be laughter. I'll have a joke. I might fall down. But um, our official stance as a church would be considered more continuationist. Here's what our statement of belief says. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit at work, uh, uh, at work in the church uh, of the first century are available today and are to be earnestly desired and practiced in an orderly manner. The gifts are essential to the mission of the church in the world today. We believe that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to every believer to be used for the building up of the body of Christ. These gifts are to be exercised in accordance to biblical guidelines and priorities. We believe the Holy Spirit is sovereign and may give any gifts he wants at any time he wants. And it continues down from there. You can read that on our website. Um, my, my position is uh, I grew up believing that some of the gifts... Uh, have ceased. Uh, some what are called sign gifts. That's what most of the cessationists believe is that uh, gift of tongues, gift of prophecy, gift of uh, healing uh, are called sign gifts. Uh, John MacArthur would say, and others on the cessationist side would say, that those are the gifts that you shouldn't expect anymore. That's what I grew up believing. Um, my uh, current conviction is I don't see that in Scripture. I don't see in Scripture where any gift has ceased. Um, I don't see in Scripture where it's predicted that any gift would cease, and I don't see in Scripture uh, a delineation between sign gifts and community gifts. I don't know where the list of, quote, sign gifts came from. And so because I can't verify it with Scripture, I am, I'm going to be on the continuationist side. And, and that's, that's where I'm at today. And maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you feel differently, but that's, that's where we're at. Um, okay. All right. I think I answered some of the questions I received this week. You guys ready to open the Bible? Can we, can we look at some stuff? Yes. All right. We're going to be in Romans 12. And I want to walk uh, through uh, another list of the spiritual gifts. Now, I've told you uh, last week that lists of the spiritual gifts appear in only uh, five passages in the New Testament. Now, some of the gifts will be mentioned here and there, but as far as a list is concerned, there are five passages. We looked at 1 Corinthians 12 last week. That's the longest list, the, the greatest uh, explanation. But then there are some smaller ones that are used to prove similar points, and so we're going to look at one of those in Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 12 is at the end of Romans. It follows, you know, chapter 11 and chapter 10, you know, how numbers work. And so um, what's happened is, is that Paul is developing this very long, logical sequence of how the gospel works from total depravity, total dependence on God. None of us are going to make it to heaven apart from Jesus for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3, right? And then uh, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5. And so like all of this is all the way in there. Romans 10, we quote this one a lot. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so he's building this logical concluding uh, 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 I don't know, treaties uh, on, on the gospel. And then we get to Romans 12, and it's like this big aha moment. It's like, and now that we've established salvation, this is what we do with it. This is how we act. This is how we behave as a result of it. So let's, let's see how far we can get into this. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He says, he says to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. We're in the modern era. I don't know when the last time you went to a worship service that had a literal sacrifice with like a goat. Um, they don't survive it, okay? <laughs> like sacrifice and li a living sacrifice is an oxymoron. And everybody who read this in the first century would be like, oh my gosh, there's no such thing as a living sacrifice. Um, but we have been, we've, we've died to our sins, haven't we? That's, that's the imagery. And so, so to say a living sacrifice uh, is like this, this emphasis that he's making. It's going to be something like we need to surrender our wills and our lives to God regularly. I appeal to you, brothers, therefore, based on everything I just taught you about the gospel, based on what Jesus has done for you, based on what your salvation is, based on your dependency, that your righteousness is from Jesus alone. Therefore, based on all of that, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Surrender to him. Surrender to him daily. Uh, he says, he says uh, it is 
uh, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We're going to do this, and this is going to be a holy and acceptable thing to do because we're setting ourselves apart. We're going to follow him, and it's going to be our, um, our spiritual worship. The Greek phrase there is logikin la terrain. I don't know why I try to impress anybody. I can't say it. Uh, it literally means this is your reasonable response. This is your logical response to what God has done. That's how the King James translates it. It says it's your reasonable response to God. Um, you need to surrender to God because of everything that he's done. Verse two, he continues. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Notice that that phrase, be conformed, it's passive. It's not saying, hey, you stop acting like the world. That's your choice to begin acting like the world. But to be conformed into something, it's like somebody's like pushing you into a mold. Is like if, if, I'm, if I'm taking a, a, a biscuit batter, is that what it's called, dough batter? Is it a dough or a batter? It's a dough, all right, dough. Uh, I take biscuit dough and I push it into a baking pan, into the little cupcake pans. I'm conforming it to that shape. That biscuit dough doesn't have a choice. It's not choosing to become that. I'm conforming it. I'm pushing it. And Paul is like, he's warning. He's like, the world, don't be conformed to this world. It's trying to conform you into something. We're always conformed into something that is unity, something that looks the same, something that is homogenous. Um, all of my muffin tins, they're the same shape and the same roundness. Um, but instead, he says, uh, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed is also passive. You don't get to choose the transformation. Today, I'm going to become a new man. Actually, we try this every year, don't we? Every new year. New year, new me. Nope. Same you, because the next year you say the same thing, right? Because we try to transform ourselves, and we don't have the power to do that. Both of these are in the passive case. It's a command with a passive verb, just like it's going to happen. Let, let this happen instead of this. Be transformed. The, the will of God is what transforms us into unique disciples. The world is trying to conform us into uniform worldviews that all look the same. And the Lord has something unique and special for each one of us. Let's be transformed by the renewal of our minds so that we may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. One of the most common questions I get from people is, you know, hey, I've been in a church in a while, like, what does God want for me? You know what they're asking? Like, what is God's will for me? What is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my children? What is God's will for me being a parent? What is, I got this new job coming up. What is God's will? We all want to know God's will for our lives. And Paul is saying, hey, based on the gospel, what's already happened, I'm now telling you, be transformed because when you get a renewed mind, you're going to start to discern what is God's will. What is God's will for your life? It's the thing in your life that is good and is perfect and is holy. These are the things that you're going to find that is God's will for your life. So how are we going to do that? Um, we're going to quickly get into spiritual gifts now. Verse 3. Notice it starts with the word for, F-O-R. Here's a little uh, Bible study tip. I've given this once before when we were in Romans. Uh, this is especially true in Romans, but I'll just say it anytime it's in the Bible. If a sentence begins with the word, therefore, uh, you need to think, okay, this is because of what just came before. So always ask, what is the therefore, therefore? Um, and so that's, you know, that was verse one. But now when the sentence begins with the word for, I want you to uh, ask the question, how or why? So he just said, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And I want you to say, well, how? You know, how, how do we do that? For... Here's the answer. Four, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Think less of yourself. Think of yourself with sober judgment. This is how we're going to get the renewed mind is that we stop thinking we know everything. Here's the problem with a phrase like this is um, 
the people who need to hear this the most are the ones who are like, well, that's not talking about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the one. Because we all know that person, right? We all know that person at work that they've been there a grand total of 10 days, but they have a list of demands and lines in the sand that they're not going to do this and you're not going to treat me this way. Like, bro, we've been doing it that way for 25 years. You've been here a week. Like, how, do you, how are you going to know something? You're thinking of yourself too highly, right? We all know of that kid who's like 75 pounds and he snapped one football, but he's out there cursing the coach and the referee because he thinks he he knows something, he's going to be in the NFL. No, you're not, kid. Be quiet. Sit down. You're thinking too highly of yourself, you know. Um, we all have these, these friendships or these relationships where someone in there begins with the phrase, like, I deserve this. I deserve happiness. It says who? Who, who deserves anything? Any, anytime we're, like, standing on our rights, standing on what we deserve, it is thinking pretty highly of ourselves. And so we, we have to, if we're going to have this renewed mind, we're going to need to sacrifice some of our old thinking and our old thoughts. And it's when we think that we're sufficient. It's when we think that we are enough. See, the, the, this lesson about spiritual gifts, anytime you get into spiritual gifts, you find that we never have everything we need to accomplish all that God's mission is for the church. That's why we need each other's gifts. And so when we think too highly of ourselves, we don't show up or we don't trust other people with their gifts, and, and we, we kind of dwarf the, uh, the, the process a little bit. He says, he says, use sober judgment. I like that as opposed to what? Drunk judgment? Use sober judgment. That phrase, sober judgment, in Greek means right mind. It is used in a couple of other places. One of the ones that popped in my mind uh, is in Luke chapter 8 Mark chapter 5. Both of them, Jesus heals a demon-possessed guy. You may know this one where Jesus is like, who are you? And the demon-possessed guy is like, I am Legion, you know, which I got to play in a Christian play one time. I played Legion. I don't know what that says about me, but they cast me immediately for that kid. And Jesus heals him. And uh, when Jesus heals Legion, this kid with demons in him, uh, Scripture says that the people came back out of the village and they saw the guy who was formerly possessed with demons to be in his right mind and they were terrified by it. Because all of a sudden this guy who was out of his mind is now in his right mind. Who has the power to do that? But it must be the Son of God. And, and that's the same phrase that Paul uses right here. You need to have sober judgment. You need to, have to be in the right mind. You need, to, you need to think clearly, not with arrogance, not with pride, not with, not, with, not with wrong thinking that thinks too highly of yourself. There's this pandemic of reckless and toxic judgment that is plaguing the Christian community in America. Um, and it's preventing us from experiencing this renewed mind. There are prideful Christians who think so highly of themselves that it's a wonder that they even believe that they need Jesus at all. Then you have people who feel that they are so far broken that their sins are somehow bigger than what Jesus could pay for on the cross. That's a different form of pride. That, that, is, that is not in agreement with Scripture. There's legalism, and then there's false humility, where people just kind of pat themselves on the back, and they, they pretend to be weaker than others. There's self-sabotage and self-condemnation where I'm not good enough. I'm not going to ever make it. You know, I'm just a sinner. I'm just, I'm never going to make it. Well, Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so that way of thinking is not in congruence with the renewed mind that the Lord is trying to give us. And if we don't do something to stop the toxic thinking, we're never going to experience the renewed mind. Thinking of yourself with sober judgment is seeing yourself the way that the Lord sees you. Let me, let me encourage you to pray a simple prayer. Uh, it's one of those scary prayers that, like, only do it if you, like, you know, if you're really sure you want to. Uh, it's kind of like praying for patience or something. Um, try this one out for size. Lord, uh, help me see others and myself the way that you see them. Let me see them with your eyes. Amen. Simple prayer. What, what if you started to see yourself through the eyes of the gospel and started to see your neighbors and other image bearers of God through his eyes. What would that do? We need to have sober judgment for this renewed mind. Let's continue. Uh, verse four, four, how or why? Like, how, how are we going to do that? Four, as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. We are one body. This is the language that we had last week, right? We had an entire section in 1 Corinthians 12 about the body. Why does he bring up the body every time? Because you can't talk about spiritual gifts without talking about the roles we play in the church. We need the body to work. 
But he adds this phrase at the end. He says, we are members one of another. We owe one another. This, this is foreign language to America. The fact that we owe each other something in this room, no. Like, I just come to church to get what's coming to me. I come here to learn about me. No, no, no. We owe each other. We belong to each other. We owe each other the use of our gifts for their benefit, for their building up. We owe each other. We hear phrases in the church like, well, I'm not getting anything out of this church. Well, okay, well, what are you putting into this church? Uh, I, I need to go to the church that, you know, has, has, you know, has the right things for, for my kids. Okay, well, maybe go volunteer in the children's department, right? Uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe you are the one who's called. You're obviously the one who has eyes to see that. I'm, I'm not being fed in this church. Have you, have you, have you asked a question? Have you, have you looked into it a little bit more? Have you, have you joined a community group? Have you, have you gotten into a Bible study with somebody else? Like part of being fed is showing up to the table. Okay. When, when we have phrases and complaints that begin with I, we're ignoring the fact that we owe each other and we belong to each other. So it's, it's weird that we have that language in churches, but if we, take, if we go to any other environment, we understand that we have obligations. If we talk about sports, well, you know, you signed up for the sports team, you need to show up to practice. If we talk about work, imagine if you told the boss, like, you know what, I don't feel like I'm really uh, uh, enjoying this job that much. That's why I didn't show up on Thursday. Bro, you signed up to work here. You either show up or you don't. You made an obligation, okay? Your boss is going to ask you to, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if, if our kids are in dance or cheer, like if they want to be in the recital, they have to go to the practices. We, in every other category of life, understand that we have obligations and responsibilities except one, church, and we forget it. The Bible teaches that we owe ourselves to each other and we need each other. That's how the Bible teaches us. And while this isn't exactly an American virtue, it's a biblical virtue, which makes it a little bit more important. We should pay attention to it. And so I just wanted you to consider if this is true. Just, just ponder it. We are better trained and more able as Americans to discuss our individual rights than we are our individual responsibilities. How, how, how often do we see people standing up for their rights, their First Amendment right, their Second Amendment right, their, their right to do this? I have a right to be who I want, and I have a right to be called what I want. When do we see anybody standing up for their responsibilities? I have a responsibility to show up. We're so trained to fight for our individual rights and we neglect our individual responsibilities. I think we can do better. And I think that's what the purpose of spiritual gifts ends up being in part. Verse six, it says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So he's gonna begin this list of gifts. He's gonna give a, a list of now seven gifts. An important thing to know is that every list of gifts in the New Testament, all five of the passages, have a different list with different numbers of gifts. That's important um, for understanding uh, how, we, how, we, how important to think of them. Uh, but he says, let us use them. If we're going to do this, we need to use these gifts. And what I like about this list of seven gifts is that he gives the name of the gift, and then he gives like a, a qualifying phrase for how to use it. So I just want to look at that with you. Uh, verse 6, it says, the first gift he gives is, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If you have the gift of prophecy, use it in proportion to the faith you have to speak that thing. Uh, I would call this like faithful prophecy. Um, your prophecy uh, is never going to be bigger than the foundation of our faith, which is going to be scripture. Nobody should ever have a prophetic word that is against scripture. Like that's not how prophecy works. And if you're ever in a church, it's like someone's like, hey, I got a prophecy. God's not using Psalms anymore. We're doing something else. Like, oh, bro, no. <laughs> like, that is very much not in accordance with how that gift is supposed to work. It's in proportion to our faith. Verse 7, if service, if you have the gift of service, in our serving. If you have the gift of service, use it by serving others just as you were served. You know, you, you, I would call this like pay it forward service. You, you have the gift of serving, and so you're serving out of an overflow of like someone served you. I, I see this at work in my family's life because of how thankful we were for the help that so many of you did after our house flooded a couple of times that we can't help but to like jump in and help somebody else because it's just like, what, how, how guilty should I feel if I'm like, well, stinks to be you. I hope you can get out of that on your own. No, like we pay it forward. It's a pay it forward service. 
It says, the one who teaches, verse 7, the one who teaches in his teaching. If you have the gift of teaching, use it to teach from the overflow of your learnings. I call this uh, teaching out of curiosity. People with the gift of teaching, they're... they're uh, um, never satisfied with the last answer. They're always like, they're curious about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And, they're dig- and then they just love explaining the things that they've learned. Uh, verse eight, the one who exhorts, that is um, encourages, that's a, a more modern word, in his exhortation. If you have the gift of encouragement, use it to encourage others just as you've been encouraged. Um, I call this uh, contagious encouragement. To the one who contributes in generosity, he says, if, if you have the gift of giving, that's the gift of contributing, do it in generous in generosity and, and um, uh, just you, you keep doing it. Uh, I can't think of another word besides generously. I didn't even write one. Uh, I call this generous giving to the one who leads. If you have the gift of leadership with zeal, you, you don't lead out of a source of obligation. You lead out of passion. You love what you're doing. You love that you're, you're bringing people along. Um, to the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is happy mercifulness. You, you know some people who they forgive you through like the, the grit of their teeth? Like they can't even open their mouth like, ah, oh, you can get away with it this time, buddy. You know, like that is not this gift, okay? If you have the gift of mercy, it's like your joy to release someone of their burdens. It's your joy to partner alongside them and say, look, I know you messed up, um, but we're going to figure out how to rebuild you right now, okay? Uh, it's the one who like, as they've repented, they're like, I'm so sorry I've done something. The person with the gift of mercy is the first one to go up beside them like, hey, it's okay. We all make mistakes. Let's do this together. And they, they join them cheerfully, happily. So verse 9, he says, uh, he's switching gears from spiritual gifts to these are behaviors that all Christians should do, okay? Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Let love be genuine as opposed to counterfeit love, faking it. Hey, brother, I hope you're okay. But to actually ask someone how they're doing, to actually lean into them and, and have a conversation, that's, that's great. Let love be genuine and hate, a detest, abhor what is evil, what is wrong in the world. Like, push it away. Don't, don't have tolerance for that. Instead, we need to hold fast to what is good. It's so easy to see the negative in the world and hold fast to that. Like, ah, you know, the politics are this, and, you know, we're never going to get a leg up, and, oh, my gosh, property taxes, can we all agree? You know, like, to hold fast to all the evil things in the world. Um, Instead, hold fast to what is good. As a body of people, you have genuine love for each other. You push against the evil, and you hold fast to those things that are good. Like, let's look at the beauty in this world. Let's point to it. Let's celebrate it. Let's, let's, Let's see it. So I want you to pay attention to this flow of logic because I think that this changes the math on so many ways that the church works. And I believe that Carpenter's Way is uniquely gifted at loving in this way. I just, I find our people so good at this. I don't even, I think I'm just like telling you how the secret sauce works, okay? Paul is given a recipe for how to get here in these first few passages of, of Romans. How will we know the difference between good and evil? If we're conformed to this world, our mind isn't even trained to know the difference between good and evil. We will call evil good, and then we'll celebrate it, right? Um, And so how will we know the difference? Well, verse 2 says that we need to have a renewed mind, okay? We need to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Okay, well, how do we get the renewed mind? Verse 3, well, we need to stop thinking too highly of ourselves, and we need to start thinking of ourselves with sober judgment according to the assignments that the Lord has given us. We think of ourselves in sober judgment according to the roles that we're given, the gifts that have been apportioned to us because we're using them in the body. Verse 5, we use our gifts, our assignment within the body because... We have a responsibility to do that. We have a responsibility to each other that we're sitting next to. We owe ourselves to the people next to us. If we do those three steps, we're going to find that we see the difference between good and evil, and we're going to love genuinely. Spiritual gifts comes hand in hand with how we experience the renewed mind that Paul is talking about. And so every Christian, and if you're a Christian in here, this is true, every Christian is called to full-time ministry. You're called to be a part of something. You're called to, to be marching the mission forward. He says, he says in verse 10, love one another uh, with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the 
Lord. Make no mistake about it. The use of our gifts in serving the body is translated, according to Paul, to serving the Lord. Look at that last sentence, serve the Lord. This, we get credit as if we're doing things on behalf of Jesus directly to him by serving one another. He says, don't be slothful in zeal. Don't be slothful. Don't, don't wait around inactively waiting for someone to beg you to do a thing. Um, are, are, you, are you just waiting for someone or are you seeking how to use your gifts? Are you slowing down the movement towards the mission or are you stepping forward before you're even being asked? Are you waiting to be asked or are you asking around to find your role, to find your place? Because every Christian is called to full-time ministry. Have you found your ministry yet? I want to... Um, before I close this out, I want to apologize because uh, several people in the last three months have come to me and like, hey, I am ready. I am ready to do a thing in the church. What do you need? What can I do? And most of those people are still waiting for me to put that together. You're doing the very thing that I'm encouraging you to do. It is not your fault that you haven't been put into a role. It's more me, okay? It's more I can't uh, get all the plates spinning in the right direction in exactly the right time. And so I want to acknowledge that some, many have done that, and I want to challenge many of you to begin thinking right now, okay, but what is my role? How are my gifts to be used? What I was going to do right now is, as time allows, is that I was going to go over and define some of the spiritual gifts we've already gone over, but time does not allow because uh, Jesse be long-winded today. Um, and so uh, I want to uh, save that. Next week, we'll look at uh, several of the gifts, look at definitions and examples of them. And so hang with me, or maybe I'll put out a video or something to, to help teach that. What, what I want to close with is this, is that every follower of Jesus is called and assigned to full-time ministry. Your greatest joy, your greatest satisfaction will be found when you do the thing you were designed to do. The, hands down. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works he has prepared beforehand for us. Your spiritual gift is your key to knowing what your roles are, the good works you were designed to do. They have your name on them. They're waiting for you to say yes to them. And nobody's going to do it as well as you are, um, big or small, public with a spotlight like this, or I'm secretly an introvert, just like back in the back doing a thing. What is your ministry? I just uh, quickly, if I could just give you a few examples of what I've seen around the church. Um, some of these... Uh, I hesitate to say names. If I embarrass anybody, I, I apologize. But I, I think it's important that you guys know like how some of these roles work. We have, we have deacons that they sign up to, and they show up on Sundays and they're just behind the scenes making sure little things are set up. And every little problem, uh, I was, like w one of the deacons was like wiping windows today. Is he tasked with cleaning windows? Does he have a spiritual gift of cleaning windows? Not necessarily. He was doing it because the windows were dirty, and he's a deacon today, and he, he cleaned the, uh, the windows. We have elders that they meet for leadership and things like that. But then we have members of all these various teams. Do you know that we have probably 45 adults that give up community groups on Wednesday nights to make sure that small groups in this room with teenagers have a leader, uh, that they give up Wednesday nights and they go and uh, they serve cafe and snacks to the kids? Um, I, I told uh, Mr. Adams this morning about a conversation that he had with somebody that they told me yesterday was the reason that they came to the church. That conversation was over two, three years ago now. It was during COVID, like people were still wearing masks at the time. And, and Mr. Adams, he's, he's not on staff here. He's not a deacon here. He's just some guy who loves these people, and he always shows up. He's one of the first people here, and he will greet you when you get here. Uh, Miss Phyllis told me last week that on her way to church last week, she felt like the Lord wanted her to buy some donuts, and she brought donuts, and those kids were joyful in those donuts. Here's someone just using their gift um, to, to serve. I don't know why donuts choke me up, guys. You know, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes they just get in you. Um, we've got people, <laughs> yes ma'am, yes ma'am. We've got people that at the drop of a hat, the slightest hint that there is a need, they just show up. They leave work to get up here to spray mosquito poison because we're about to have an event. They get up here because the air conditioner is leaking and I have an emergency counseling appointment on the other side of town and they just showed up to, to work. We have so many people that are using their gifts and so I don't wanna preach this and say, you know, shame on all of you for not doing it. 
I'm saying we need to understand how much it matters. We owe each other. And if this body is going to accomplish the mission that the Lord has for it, it's going to be because we all show up and we all do what we're called to do and we use the gifts that God has given us. Okay, so I'm going to pray. Ah, da, da, so long. Uh, I have a list of uh, gifts we can talk about uh, next time. Uh, I apologize for being long. It's just, it is the way. Uh, pray with me. Heavenly Father, uh, thank, you for, thank you for the beauty of this body. I'm so thankful for these people. And um, I just pray that you continue to show us our role, show us our place. Help us to have that renewed mind through the use of our gifts, that we become transformed people, no longer being conformed and thinking the ways that this world is trying to force us to, but we see your goodness, your beauty, and your perfect will in our lives and in our community because you are working in this body through the use of our gifts. We love you. pray this in Jesus' name.